This story is told using a variety of flashbacks. So, to prevent confusion, when you hear this sound... That means it's the beginning or end of a flashback. Enjoy. Enjoy. Chapter 3 Nick I open my eyes. At first, I'm so dizzy that it's hard to make out anything. The last thing I remember is hearing Sierra scream from the back seat, but I can't remember why she was screaming. When I finally overcome my vertigo, I become aware of the smoke filling the air and its terrible stench. I look directly in front of me and see that the front of the car is smashed and that we've hit a tree. I hear myself speak, but I don't process the words I'm saying. Dad, are you o- My words abruptly get caught in my throat when I look over at my dad and see the person leaning in through his open window. Confusion dazes me for a moment as I sit there, unable to figure out what is happening. He's seemingly passed out and the stranger is leaning over the side of him. I can't tell what gender they are and it almost looks like they're kissing his neck. But then I notice the blood dripping down the side of it. And then I see the open tissue and I hear the disgusting smacking of their lips and the sound of them chewing. Again, I hear my voice and this time I'm screaming, but my mind almost feels like it's lagging behind my body. My dad is dead and this monster is eating him. My eyes flutter open, and I dart into an upright position, hyperventilating. I look around to take notice of the silent, dark room I'm in. Calmness washes over me, and I calculate the time. It's late morning, and I curse myself for oversleeping. Pulling back the covers, I slide out of bed and turn on the light. I get dressed and unlock my bedroom door, peering outside before leaving the comfort of my sleeping space. The workshop remains as still and untouched as I left it last night before bed. I always begin my mornings by making sure that everything is in its rightful place and nothing is missing. If something were missing, it would indicate that someone else has invaded my space and taken it. It is important for me to keep my workshop protected. There are valuables within it that can be very dangerous if placed in the hands of the wrong person. That aside, my location shouldn't be compromised. Although the current danger seems to be coming from Galago, there are always other forces lurking underneath our suspicions. Forces Sierra knew about, but could never trust in explaining to me. The second thing I need to check every morning is the tunnel. I trust in my traps to secure the entrance to the workshop. However, they do not exist without their flaws. I have security cameras set up at every checkpoint, but there are always blind spots. As I look through what is displayed on my monitors, I ponder that maybe I should take a walk through the tunnel for further evaluation. It seems to be still and unbothered right now, but that could always change. As I think about all this, I look up at my masks, deciding which one is appropriate for leaving the workshop right now. Today I'm feeling particularly paranoid, so I will utilize the Mask of Sight. I take it down from its perch on my wall, and study it before putting it on. I remember that it used to be much more vibrant but its dark crimson color has begun to fade, and its paper mache surface is falling apart. I might have to repair it soon, but that is a tricky process. Originally, I wanted it to be sturdier. I wished it could be a stabler material, like plastic or even metal, but the notes Sierra gave me explicitly said that masks had a certain way that they must be made, and no other way could work. There were things that I never understood about her notes, but I can never ask her. After all, it's been decades since I last saw her, and I'm not entirely certain that she's even alive at this point. As soon as I put on the mask, I see a boy at the entrance to the tunnel. He's going to press the call button. He wants to talk to me. He delivers a message from Elder Warden. My presence has been requested at the temple. I don't allow the boy the time to even go through with these actions before I throw on a jacket and leave the workshop. The boy is about to press the call button by the time I make it to the end of the entrance tunnel, and he looks up as he hears me approaching. Oh! Prodigy Baxter, I- I'm aware that Warden has requested I see him, I inform the boy. I walk past him without another word. I can already tell what Warden has to discuss with me is important. I've felt for a while now that things are soon to change. The chaos brought on by Gallico has been dormant for nearly two decades now and I knew it wouldn't stay that way for much longer. 
The temple is a short walk away from my workshop. Both locations are a fair distance from the main village as I walk down the gravel path that leads up to the temple entrance. I tried to remember when the last time I visited the village was. It's been quite a while because there's nothing I really gained from going. Lana and I used to go up to the village to visit friends when she still lived here, but things have since gotten a lot quieter. I wouldn't say I missed those days, but back then things were a lot happier. I take my mask off when I walk inside because I know Warden doesn't like me wearing it. The council room is as dark as it usually is and it does well to hide them. The elders are rarely seen in complete lighting and when it's dark like this, the only part of them that is visible are their glowing eyes. It used to bother me, because it reminded me of the black visions I used to have, back when my energy was still so unstable. However, I've grown used to it. The layout of the council room is strange as well. Ahead of the entryway is a bridge that crosses what I assume is some sort of cavernous ravine, and further past that bridge is the platform where all the elders sit. It isn't accessible from the bridge, as it would be considered blasphemous to stand on the same ground as that of the highest beings in the universe. The Elders have kept the balance of the universe for several centuries, and they're the closest thing to what humans would consider gods. I had never believed in such higher beings growing up, which is ironic because now I stand in line, faithfully serving them as a future successor. As I walk across the bridge and reach the small platform at the end of it, I stare up at the darkness in front of me. In the center of the council stage, I see a pair of luminescent violet eyes blink open. Following that, I hear Warden sigh. His tremendous presence seems to shake the very earth around us, and I notice that he seems to be the only elder present at the moment. You called for me, sir. I call out after a moment of silence. I did. He replies in his loud, grumbling voice. He sounds different in this form as opposed to his humbled human shape. His voice is substantially more gravelly and strained as it makes him sound older. I suppose he is fairly old, whether his human form accommodates that or not. I'm sure you've noticed something foul in the air. He continues. I think about the feeling that has been haunting me since I woke up this morning. I've noticed. I inform the great deity. He sighs again, and his breath shakes the licking flames that light the bridge. Galico is on the move. Warden says. I pause, thoughtfully, before I reply. If Galico is on the move, that means the children are no longer safe in their hiding places. I take it that he's in pursuit of the children now, then. I respond. Yes, it's time, Dick. His voice bellows back. I sigh as a memory dances across my conscience. I recall my two-year-old son playing in the garden. I had only looked away for a moment. It only took a moment to shatter the peaceful life we once had. I will contact Jessica immediately. I tell my superior. We do not share many more words before I leave, and as I walk back into the beaming sunlight, I tap the power signal on my earpiece and watch the screen appear before my eyes. The display looks just like any science fiction movie would have it, and I remember finding this amusing when I was younger. Tapping through my contacts, I feel Jess's signal and page her. It doesn't take long for her to find me, I could feel the wariness in her tone when she responds. Nick? What's going on? She asks me. Her voice is distorted, and I can only assume it's because the signal had to travel several light years in distance. It's time, I inform her. There is a moment of silence as she processes the information. What do you need from me? She finally offers. Keep an eye on the kids on Earth. As for Jack, Graves should be headed on your way soon. And I want you to assign him the task of retrieving Jack. I'll also be sending someone else over to provide some additional assistance, I explained to her. <laughs> you think I'm going to be able to convince Oliver to help? Just retorts feel a smile etch into my features. Try, I say. Jess chuckles on the other end, and as I hang up, I look over at the sudden guest I have standing to the side of me. He leans against the stone banister, picking at his nails shamelessly, and his greasy black hair catches every ray of light bouncing off it. 
When I look his way, he returns the glare and speaks up. You really bringing him home, huh? He asks me. His voice has always agitated me. It sounds like nails on a chalkboard. But I have less control over his physical appearance than I do his actions. It isn't safe for him to be apart from me anymore. Besides, he's old enough to be taught how to use his energy to protect himself now, I remark. Axel gives me no more of a reply than a shrug, and I narrow my eyes at him in a scrutinizing expression. I trust you've given me accurate information pertaining to his well-being, yes? I challenge him. Axel sighs and stands up straight, brushing the dust off his suit. He's doing just fine. He snarls. I watch him disappear as I turn back in the direction of the workshop. I have a lot of work to do before Oliver gets here. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this week's chapter, make sure to check out all our social media to keep updated with the release of future chapters. And also make sure to check out all the actors, musicians, and artists that make this series possible.